Do you want to be a radical for Jesus? Well, this is Pastor David, host of Restoring Your Voice, and that's what this show is geared toward. Geared toward everyday Christians to equip you for the good works of Jesus and live out your faith radically. And I hope you enjoy this episode of Restoring, Restoring Your, your Voice. Voice. All righty then, welcome to this episode of Restoring Your Voice with me, your host, Pastor David. So glad that you could join me today. Um, hey, real quick, why don't you hit that subscribe button, wherever you're watching this from. If you're watching this on Facebook, head on over to the YouTube channel. If you came across this video, don't forget, if you never subscribed before, you're watching this stuff, hit that subscribe button, hit that bell notification icon, and click all for all notifications. Uh, oh, and real quickly, uh, did you check out the new website and did you sign up for my newsletter yet? I just came out with a new blog article today, which is kind of mirrors the uh, subject of this episode. So go check it out. Uh, make sure you hit, like I said, make sure you sign up to receive my newsletter so you don't miss out when I put up, publish the new content. All right, so that's out of the way. Um, oh yeah, hey, if you hear some noise in the background, um, don't worry about it. They're putting up houses behind me. So uh, there's that. Anyway. So today's subject, um, I want to get into, let me, let me preface and say, you know, there's times I honestly wish I didn't have to talk about this kind of stuff. I wish I could be on there saying, keep going. You're doing great. Uh, you're, you're praying. Uh, here, here's how to study the Bible more. Uh, things like that. I, I honestly wish I could pre, uh, preach, write, talk about those type of things, but I can't. And I, and I'm not going to walk in disobedience to what God wants me to talk about. And we need to get into today a tough subject, um, a tough subject that, you know, people can basically claim to be Christians, claim they live like Christians, but there's, they live without any expectations to, to live as Christians. Um, so yeah, um, while you're watching this and you have any questions on this subject about what does that even mean? Uh, maybe you have questions about, oh, I don't know what it means. Like, what does it mean, Christian expectations? Like, what do you mean I have to do? What is this? What is that? Babe? Whatever. Please ask them in the chat. I'll do my best to get to them. But I want to talk about this because that's primary. Well, I think I think the uh, vast majority of the world is uh, highly secular compared to America. But make no mistake, we're going that way. Make, make no mistake that, that we have compromised the message of the gospel. We, we have compromised... What's in the Bible for each and every single one of us? And um, I'm going to read you some quotes to just highlight what I mean. All right. Anyway, these are some quotes. These are some quotes by people professing Christians, some of them pastors. And this should alarm you. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to leave them up there for you to read for yourself. Um, you can read them pretty much there. And this is stuff inside the church, mind you. There are churches out there, by the way, who affirm sin. They affirm it. They excuse it. They come up with all sorts of workarounds for, for sin to be excused. And this should alarm you. This should alarm every single one of us. Let, let me let me uh, let me let me uh put out some grace here though, and as well as warning. All right. While no Christian will ever obey God's commandments perfectly, all right? While every Christian will sin, the true Christian will never excuse it. The true Christian will repent. So those who try to work around sin for whatever reason, whatever excuse they come up with, are can never are not true Christians. Because no true believer will, will excuse sin. No, no true Christian is perfect. No true Christian uh, lives perfectly, but the true Christian will repent. The true Christian will be grieved by sin. But these are not those people. I mean, the, the the Bible shouts, shouts, screams against things like homosexuality, against uh, gender dysphoria, right? And obviously shouts probably the loudest throughout scripture, shouts for life and against the taking the life of the unborn. Right. It, it, it's the, the Bible is as clear as day in all of these issues. What, whatever issue you want to pick, 
whatever major issue. But these are in the church is what I'm saying. And you'll have people say like, well, God, Jesus doesn't judge anymore. He took all that upon uh, himself at the cross. So therefore, you know what? He's not going to judge anymore. Well, if that were true, I sure wish somebody would have told the churches in Asia Minor that were mentioned in the book of Revelation this. Because I guarantee you, they were judged. They didn't heed the warnings of Christ. And, and Christ certainly judged them for it. Yes, he removed his candlestick. Yes, he made war against them. I wrote about that today. You can read, read more about this in depth in my, in my uh, article today. The point being is that's a false statement. God is just because God is holy. I know we love to say God is love, God is love, God is love. But God is love is not his primary characteristic. God's primary characteristic is God is holy, which means he has a standard. And he tells us, commands us to be holy as he is holy. But you see, when we compromise that standard, and we, we can compromise it for a number of reasons. We want to bring in more people. We want to keep more people. Maybe we find that we get a greater amount of applause and likes when we speak a message that uplifts and encourages. And I'm all for uplifting and encouraging messages. But what I'm trying to get at is we, people may start to tailor their messages to only those, never with a correction, never with a rebuke. But we can't do that. That's not biblical. God warns throughout the scriptures, whether Genesis to Revelation, warning after warning after warning, right? Don't sin. Don't live in sin. Don't do that. Don't compromise. Why do you think he exhorts us and encourages us, right? To he who overcomes, for instance, multiple times in the book of Revelation with promises given. But then the flip side of that, right, will be if we choose not to overcome. And, and we in the American church are at the precipice right now. We're, we're in a very dangerous situation right now. We have compromised and compromised badly. Now, the good news is that there's still time. How much time, I, I don't know exactly. But I can assure you, our time is running out, and it's time running out. All right? Faster than many people think. And I have to issue this warning. We must repent. We must turn back. And while God still gives us a chance, yes, I know the Bible says that God is not patient as we are patient, right? He's long-suffering. And praise God for it. Because if he were not long-suffering, then I would have been taken out a long time ago, right? You would have been taken out in your sins a long time ago. This whole world would have ceased to exist if God were not patient. But make no mistake about it. God's patience will run out eventually. And we have to make a choice today. Whose standard are we going to live by? What standard? What is our litmus test? Is it what we like? Is it what makes us feel good? Is it what some TED Talk speaker says? Or is it the Bible? It's, it's one or the other, folks. It's either God or the Bible. God or his word. What is written in his word is infallible and it's inerrant and it's perfect in every single way. Thy word is truth. But we compromise on that. We want to even say, go so far as to even say that certain people are, are Holy Spirit filled. And while I'm not here to play judge, jury, and executioner with every person, God forbid I do that. But those living in these types of serious errors Right? There is in no way that they have the Holy Spirit of God because Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will lead you in all truth. For instance, that a, a man can be with a man and it's okay in the eyes of God is not truth. Right? That's a bald-faced lie. God is not okay with that. No more than his, is he okay with an unmarried man and an unmarried woman having sexual relationships. He is not. That is not truth whatsoever. What is your truth? Because we live in a day and age where it's my truth, it's your truth. You believe what I, you want. I believe what I want. Live and let live the whole nine yards. But when we get to that point, there is no truth. And we've gotten to that point in the, in the church. Uh, unfortunately, we've gotten to the point 
where the, the, the only truth is um, Jesus loves you. And that's true. Absolutely. Right? Right? In this, right, God demonstrated his love for us, the Bible says. So I, I'm, I'm on board that, it, with that statement. But they toss out the rest of the Bible. Right? How about God is angry with the wicked all day long? Yes, that is true. Right? That that those who disobey him are storing up wrath for themselves on the day of judgment. Things like that are in the Bible and true today. But we don't use all of scripture. We want to use only the parts that make us comfortable. Now we've discarded truth. Right? Now we've gotten to the point where we are today. And I don't want to see that. I, I don't want to see it any longer because we don't have to right whom the sense is free is free indeed we have we have these wonderful promises in the world in the word right we have wonderful promises whom the sense is free is free indeed we get promises about the holy spirit empowering us being no longer a slave to sin things like that all throughout scripture that's the good news and it's the most wonderful news ever but there are people out there who love staying in their bondage they love it. They celebrate it, right? They, they, they even champion this, this cause to stay in bondage. They would rather stay in their bondages than, than walk through the door of freedom. It's like it's like the door has been opened, right? That's what Jesus did, right? He's like, here's a door right here. Walk, walk right through it. All you have to do is walk right through this door, and, and freedom is right there. So that's, that's all you have to do. Walk through this door here. Come to me. Turn away, come to me. And yet people, I don't know, it's it's like, uh, I can't remember the name of it, the syndrome, you know, when, when people are taken captive and they fall in love with their captors. Well, that's exactly what, it, what, what people are like. So they refuse to come out. Not only that, but may slam the door shut in the face of, of Jesus. Don't. We don't want none of you. Get out. Now, they, they have various reasons. I'm not going to get into detail. But but in the church today, we would rather comfort people in their bondages and in their slavery, in their sin, rather than offer them freedom, rather than offer them the cure, right? It, we must do that. It's not nice to hear that. It's not nice to hear the doctor give you a bad report. Hey, you are going to die unless you do X, Y, and Z. It's not nice to hear that. But it's that nice to hear at least that there's a chance if I follow the doctor's orders. But we don't preach that in the church anymore. We preach a nice, feel-good Sunday message, right? And, and, and maybe slip in uh, the offering for salvation at the end, right? No, 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 no teaching on it. No, no, no saying this is what Jesus requires of you. And you can watch Monday's episode for that. And and no no saying, hey, now, now you can no longer be controlled by sin. You don't have to live that way. We have a standard. There's expectations now for the Christian. But no, we I've and this is stuff I've seen firsthand. I'm not gonna tell you where, I'm not gonna tell you who. But people, for instance, are okay in their pornography addiction. I've seen it. Oh, it's okay, brother. We'll pray for you. Okay, where did you go wrong? No. That's no anywhere biblical. Nobody can be addicted and lust living in adultery. Since Jesus said, if we even lust after a woman, uh, if we, we've committed adultery. If we look upon a woman, commit lust in her heart, what do you think pornography is? Exactly what Jesus forbid us to do. Yet this lifestyle of disobedience to God, and somehow it's okay, brother. No, it's not okay. No, they are not a brother. And and while it make make them feel nice about themselves, it just reinforces the bondage. It just reinforces that it's okay to remain in slavery. It is not. Jesus didn't come for us to remain in sin. He came to set us free. I think we can all get on board with that statement that Jesus did indeed come to set us free. No longer do we have to be tossed 
to and fro and controlled by, by our lusts and desires. Exactly. Somebody's saying here, um, are conditional. Yes, absolutely. In fact, yes, if you love me. Yes, I've said it time again. I love that scripture verse. If you love me, Jesus says, you will obey my commandments. Plural, by the way. So all the commandments he taught while on this earth, we have to obey. Exactly. Living the Christian life is very conditional. It's not conditional as in, um, well, let me say, as in, as in we have to earn God's love. But yes, it is absolutely 1,000% conditional upon our own obedience. And the thing is, God empowers us to obey. So I can't see how a self-proclaiming Christian can still be a slave to sin. It, it's, it doesn't mesh together. Because, like I said, God empowers us to live free from sin. So I can't see how a Christian can live in sin. It, it, it doesn't work out that way. Now, I'm not saying we're perfect, right? We're still being perfected, right? Paul Paul makes this clear, uh, believe that, again, in the book of Philippians. He, he makes this abundantly clear, right? Even at that point in his life, and it's toward the end of his life, that he, he said, oh, I'm still being perfected. But he didn't make an excuse for living in sin. He didn't say, well, I live in this sin, and don't worry about it, brothers and sisters, because I'm still being perfected, right? Paul never wrote such a thing. Ever. Living the Christian life comes with expectations. What do you think being salt and light means? It means we're supposed to be different from the world. It means we're supposed to show different, not be the exact same or worse at times in the church. The sad fact is that there are people out there in the world have no relation to Christianity that live better lives than many self-professing Christians. How sad is that? How sad is that? We, we have expectations. We have expectations to pray. It is not an option. Jesus didn't say if you pray. He said when you pray. Therefore, there would be an expectation for us to be praying. We're even told to pray all the time. We're not literally walking around like monks. But the point is, uh, we live a lifestyle of prayer. That's a command. It's an expectation. This is like Christianity 101. We're not even talking about deep level stuff yet. Studying and reading our Bibles. Where's the emphasis on that? How many Christians are, are ignorant of the Bible? In fact, shortly before I came on here, shortly before I came on here, amazingly, I saw some stats on a study. It's like less than half of Christians in America even study the scriptures. How about that? Yet, it's in the Bible to study the scriptures. All scripture is God-breathing inspired, right? I don't know any other term than all, but all, all means all to me. Jesus himself would quote the scriptures. He did it when Satan attacked him, tempted him. Read the scriptures standing up in the synagogue. It's a commandment. It's an expectation, a basic expectation. Another one. All right. To be prepared at all times to give a reason for the hope that is in you. Yeah, apologetics. It's another basic requirement for every believer. We're not even in the deep stuff yet. Let's unpack that one for a second. Let's unpack that one for a second. If you've been set free, if Jesus is truly truly your Lord, then you have a story. And, and, and you don't have to quote scriptures front, back, and center. Just tell people your story. Jesus, I was this way, now I'm that way. I was a slave to sin in this way, Jesus set me free in that way. That's a reason for hope that is within you. That's apologetics. Right there. Oh, you Christian? Oh, what do you mean? Why should I become a Christian? Me, me, me. Well, you know what? I was a nasty person just like you. I'm no longer a nasty person. I love everybody. There you go. You know, got some people watching in here. I know one of them I interviewed. Staunch atheist. I've interviewed a couple of people who are formerly staunch atheists. Hated God. Hated the things of God. 
right? All, all, all that and more. And, and, and then what ended up happening, they met God. They were redeemed. They have this love in their heart. I'm like, so you don't have to have per perfect understanding of things, right? You don't have to do that. You don't have to be a, a scholar to do apologetics, but it's expected of every Christian out there. No matter who you are, no matter where you are at in life, you are. this is what is expected of you. So, but how many people actually are able to do that? I don't know if I tell people about God, I might, they might hate me. I might this, I might that. And they give every reason under the sun. Yet they have the nerve to claim the title Christian. Yet disobeying these, these very basic Christian principles, I'll put it that way. These very basic Christian principles. The very tenets. How about this one? Here's another one. Claim to be a Christian. What church body are they a part of? The Bible tells, do not forsake the gathering of the saints. Don't, don't forsake it. Do it. Church, wh who, who did Paul write to, for instance? He wrote to local bodies. Right? Every, every, you know, min minus the uh, pastoral epistles. Right? Minus the, the um, pastoral epistles like um, Timothy and Titus. The other letters of Paul were written to churches. The churches, the church in Corinth, the church in Ephesus, the, the church in Galatia, right? The church in Thessalonica. Those are all church bodies that Paul wrote to. So minus the pastoral epistles, right? And when he was writing to Timothy and Titus, right? And, and how to be as leaders, he wrote to church lo local church bodies. He never wrote to just individuals saying, keep your Christian faith up. That's what you need to do better. He never once did that. It is a biblical command to be, to be, to attend church, be, to be part of a local church body. Yet people say, I'm a Christian, and they never attend church. What? That's like saying, I don't know. We'll, we'll throw something out there. That's like saying I work for Amazon, but I've never showed up to work. I, I work for Apple, but I've never showed up to work. I, I'm, a, I'm a soldier in the army, but I've never even been to basic training. That, that is what it, that's exactly what it is like. Don't attend church. Not, not to mention the numerous benefits of attending a church, the numerous benefits of fellowship, of being with our family, gathering together, fellowshipping is innumerable. Paul himself alludes to this, right? We're all one, led by the same spirit, different parts of a what? A body, right? My hand here doesn't go off and, and, and uh, do its own thing, right? My foot doesn't go walking on its own. Right? One body. We're supposed to be one body working together. The benefits are innumerable. Not to mention to do otherwise is to disobey and live in disobedience. But we okay these things. Now, of course, I know there's understanding, there's room there. I get it. Health, health reasons, things like that. I get it completely. Believe me, I do. Believe me, I do. People are housebound. Okay, we're, we're not talking about those. We're talking about Christians who are able to attend church. That's what we're talking about here. Ably bodied to attend and just do not. But we okay these things. right? We, we okay um, vitriol. right? Vitriolic speech. People saying the most hateful of things to each other and to others. Just and we okay it. Yet the Bible commands us not to let any unwholesome speech come from our mouth. And I get it. We've all fallen prey to this one, I guarantee. I guarantee every one of us. But it's not normative. You see what I'm saying? That's what I'm getting at. I'm not, I'm not getting at those, those times when we all fall short. I'm getting, talking about, is unwholesome speech the norm for us? Do we make dirty jokes? 
Do we laugh at dirty jokes? Do we cuss others out? Yeah, there are you just you know I dare you just just go on Facebook one day. Choose a, a Christian ministry with a large following. All right, go on there. You'll see professing Christians cussing other people out. I it just happened to me the other day. A professing Christian on Monday's Q and A session who told me, and I quote, to F off. That's what he told me. A professing Christian, yet the Bible says, do not let any unwholesome speech proceed from our mouth. Those, that's a Christian expectation. And we're not talking, oh, as a pastor, you are expected to do. As an apostle, just basic everyday Christian living. Like I said, my also, yeah, you know, this comes back to what I said. Mine is the pastoral epistles, which, by the way, there is a lot of truth in those for the everyday believer. Paul wrote to the church, is telling them this, telling them, that, telling them, just everyday believers, what to do, what not to do, in other words, how to conduct themselves. There are expectations when you come to Christ. Very real expectations. And, and like I said, it we're empowered to live that way. There's, there's no reason we can't. There's no reason we shouldn't. I don't, see, I don't see it where a Christian lives a life of sinning, a lifestyle of sin. I don't see it anywhere in the Bible. I, I'm just going to come out and say it. It's impossible. It's impossible for the true born-again believer to have a sinful lifestyle. I'm just going to come out and say it. Why? Because it's what the Bible says. Right? It, it, it is impossible. In fact, I think it says in 1 John, for those who have seen the Lord to go on sinning. It's impossible. It, it's not normative. Why do we excuse it? But see, like any organization, church being no different, in this regards, when we compromise these things, we've set a new standard, right? When I was in the army, somebody would tell me, when you walk by something and you don't correct it, you've just set the new standard. And I wholeheartedly agree with it. And for too long, we've walked by substandard things. We walk by substandard beliefs, right? In other words, in contradiction to what God says, and we've said nothing. We've been silent on the issue for too long, church. It's time for us to step up. It's time for us to come out and say, this is wrong, this is right, not according to me, but according to God. This is what it says in his holy word. There's no two ways about it. Get right with God or not, in or out. Because God gives us the ability to do that. But there's no in-between. There's no, oh, I'm a part of a Christian. And now, over here, I'm getting to be a Christian. Christian or not Christian. Light, dark, blessings, curses, the whole nine yards. So, we have a standard to live by. Where do we find it? In the Bible. Just just crack it open. And I urge you when you do, by the way, don't 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 read it with somebody else in mind. Read it with yourself in mind. Read read it for yourself. How does this apply? How does this apply to me? Okay, maybe I need to shore up this area. Maybe maybe I maybe maybe my tongue is, is wild at times and then needs rain on it. Whatever it may be, I don't know. That's one example out of numerous ones. Regardless, though, regardless, please, 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 by all means, study the Bible. Study the Bible. Do the things. In fact, in fact, if you say you're a Christian 
and you're living in the continual disobedience to, to God. All right, I'm not talking about God's personal what He wants you to do, though. There, though there is that. We're we're going to start with the basics here, right? The things every Christian should live by, right? Like the things in the Sermon on the Mount. How are we supposed to live? Read those things and say, hey. When I read those things, can I say that I do them? I didn't say do them perfectly. But when I see what I read in here, am I living by that? And and when I don't, do I excuse it? Do I okay it? Or do I repent? Even do I even if if you have to confess those sins to another, as the Bible tells us to do. And, and if you read it. And you come to the conclusion, I, I'm not living by this. Then you've just come to the conclusion that you're not a born again believer. You've just come to, come to that conclusion. Well, good thing is that also when you read those the scriptures, there is hope in there for you. There, there is hope in there for you. And why am I speaking to singular people? Because it's the people that make up the church. It's the people that make up the church. So if we want to see a turnaround, if we want to see revival, then it's going to start with you and it's going to start with me. That's where, that's where it's going to start. It's going to start with individuals before it starts corporately. Before it starts in this church or, or that city or that state, it starts with you and it starts with me first. And we find how it's going to be done in the Bible. We, we find when we repent for our ways. And if you've okayed sin, you need to repent. Come to, come to Christ. Repent of it. Right? Maybe you've compromised in areas, right? You, 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 I wouldn't say you're not a Christian. I wouldn't go that far. But you found yourself compromising along certain points. Whatever the reasons may be. Maybe it's to please people, not to be offensive, whatever. I don't know. But if that's you, then simple solution. Come to Jesus today. Just, just bring, bring it before him. Hey, Lord, I, I've compromised in this area of insert. Lord, uh, I shouldn't have done it. I knew it. I shouldn't have, but I did it anyways. And just pour your heart out to him. He'll fix it for you. Believe me. He'll do it. All right? Yes, God is just. God is also merciful. And God is full of grace. And he's quick to forgive. He's slow to anger. But if we want to see a turnaround, it's going to start individually right here in our own hearts. Right here in our own life. So my question is then, what are, we, what are you going to do about it? If you're maybe you're one of those that is complaining and you see all this happening. And you're like, oh, maybe, maybe, you, maybe you just complain about it all. Well, instead of complaining, what are you going to do about it instead? It's easy. It's easy to offer the problem. Right? It's a whole other ballgame to offer the solution. So what are you going to do? It's up to you. It's not up to me. Not up to anybody else. The decision now is in your hands. The good news is, if you choose to live fully for Christ, Right, if you choose to say, you know what, I, I don't like compromise, and when it's spotted in my life, I'm, I'm going to do what I can to short up. Guess what? It's going to happen. You just continue in that work of perfection. But just know, there are expectations for Christian living. And if we don't turn around, God is going to have no choice but to judge us. Because we refuse to listen. So, with that, be blessed. But to heaven, it's a one way, one truth, one life. That's why we're not ashamed of the name of Jesus. And we don't care if the whole world sees.